time talking about this. This is probably not gonna be the only one time that we are ever talking about this. Recorded. Yes. So then. Uh, yes, it, um, teach us, professor. Okay. Oh. Why did you have the uh, fluid students call you? Judd. Not Mr. Judd. Mr. Judd. I, I do like not have a doctorate degree. She does not have any teaching ability. <laughs> uh, so I put the link to the GitHub. Also, I, I, I put on, on the slide if you want to invite anyone from here. Yeah. That, it's too, it's too late. Yeah. Anyways. Yes. Okay. So we are recording this soon. Um, the purpose for this is that then we can just have these four people in the future will have exactly the same questions. Um, yes. Right. right. I'm going to come over here and. So, um, let's, let's just, just make a conversation on questions. Uh, but first, I'm, I'm going to just, just introduce now here's like some more of the governing equations come from. And once we have the governing equations, then we can actually start, okay, how do you think? Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, I like it. Uh, Taylor. Taylor, are you there? Yeah. Uh, how's the audio? How what? How is the audio? Can you hear me well? Depends on how close you are. Hmm, that's inconvenient. Uh, I could I could use my phone microphone. You could do an acoustics analysis of the room. Let's let's try this. I mean, I can hear that. Uh, try try standing back at the board and see what it sounds like. Can you hear this? Yeah, I can hear it. Okay, is it is it fussy? Yeah. Like, how's the quality? It's actually just fine. Okay, perfect. So you don't have to worry about it. Okay. Um, so for the people that are not here at the lab, well, actually, let, let me use you some panoramic view. 
Say hello. Yeah. Hello. Anyways. Um, so as, as a, as a bit of context, uh, so Ryan, he asked me yesterday to explain where all the instabilities of NPM come from, to be able to understand how to go about running simulations. So uh, to be able to talk about that, we have to dive into the governing equation. So in this session, we're just going to uh, just talk about the, the governing equations of the VPM, what the VPM method is. is. Um, with, that, with that ground, then we can talk about the instabilities. So this session is being recorded, and then later on, it's going to be available online for as a resource for the lab. Um, yes. As uh, some con context, give me one second. Let me share my screen really quick. Uh, I'm gonna put the this link here on the on the on the chat. Where is the chat? Um, so yesterday, uh, Ryan, when you asked me about the VPM, my first question was, okay, what sort of instabilities are you referring? Is it the VPM or is it flow on a steady solver? And, and the, the, the reason why I'm asking this is because of this. You want to look at this closure? Sure, yeah. So on the flow on a steady framework, you have the VPM solver that is over here. And this is the one that is solving the Navier Stokes uh, equations. Right. Um, and he's doing all the uh, embedding particles, doing convection, diffusion, stretching of particles, and relaxa relaxation, all that. And then as one of those steps, you have the whole aerodynamic solver. So that the, the BPM right. is, is is separate from the the like the wing solvers and water solvers. So right. So there are sorts of instabilities here in the BPM itself, and that's what we're we're gonna talk about right now. Uh, and then, but th then there are other sources of instabilities in the aromatic solvers because everything is loosely coupled. So there are some some instabilities that they can be addressed by just relaxation and then uh, those relaxations. Yeah. So any instability that is here in the aerodynamics engine is way easier to address on the VPM server. So. Great, yeah. Okay. It makes more sense why you asked about that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't realize that there was instabilities in the sol aerodynamic solver right. rather than just the VPM. Yes. Okay. Um, so, so first we start from Navier Stokes. Can you guys see uh, Taylor or Mark? Yeah. Uh, can, um, can you see the whiteboard at all? Um, the quality makes it so that it gets a little bit blurry. So if you write bigger or get closer. Mm. Yes. So we have uh, so th this is the the linear momentum term in the other situation, right? Uh, so so most of the solvers they, they take these equations and then they, they put a mesh and then they try to solve the, the couple problem of the velocity field with the pressure field. And since it is a couple problem, then you have to do all sorts of uh, forward stepping, backward stepping to, to, to solve these two fields at the same time. Right? Um, yes. So that, that, that's one, one approach. Now the BPM comes out of taking this equation 
uh, taking the curl of, uh, over all of this. So you take the curl over all, all of this. And then you end up with uh, this. Do we, do, 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 do we need to do a development of this like this? Yeah, I brought it up two times. Okay. I did two of those as well. Okay. So that, the, the, uh, yeah. If you want to write down the answer. Uh, so the, the, the only important things in, in, the, in those steps to get to, to the logistic form is to, is to keep track of the assumptions. The only assumption that you take there is that uh, the, the velocity field is incompressible and that the the rotisic field is divergent stream. With those two assumptions, taking the curl over this, you end up on um, this tall der derivative for the uh, rotisic field. Uh, but it says this is how the rotisic field evolves in time. It says that you have a stretching term. And then a viscous diffusion term. Uh, yes. So you go from from this uh, equation that is in terms of pressure and, and velocity into only one into, into an equation that it, it, it is in terms of rotisity and velocity. But we know that vorticity came from the velocity field. So it is the same. The, 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 the velocity and the pressure is the same there. Uh, yes. So we here's the curve all the way here. So assume that it's divergent speed. Good, battery. Oh, it's, I think it just uh, it came partially unplugged. Oh, I just pushed it back in as a charger. Yeah, this is still. Yeah. Hello. Tell her. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. Uh, so, just just a question. Yeah. So you're uh, so you just assume that the the so you're basically assuming steady. Is that what the no 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 this is steady. Oh no, with the velocity. No, that's a uh, that's a. Uh, Irrotational, right? Or uh, no. Uh, the, no. The, the velocity is not irrotational, irrotational at all. It is just incompressible. Okay, just incompressible. Okay. Right. And that's so that's how it differs from potential flow, is right. that it's just incompressible. It's not irrotational. Right. So potential flow would assume uh, both. Or it can, uh, can be irrotational. Uh, so potential flow would assume that it's a steady, that it is incompressible, and, the, and that it is uh, irrotational, and inviscid. So in oh, here, right, right. In here in the in the, right. in the governing we'll equations, so we have, the, yeah. So in the, in the governing the equations that, that we are uh, deducing right now, we we have that it's fully viscous, it is fully unsteady, um, and it's completely rotational, like it's, it's governed by by vorticity. Okay. Ryan? My question was about the divergence free assumption. Right. And so how does that lead to saying that divergence of the vorticity be zero? Yes. So uh, actually so 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 his question is about uh, the assuming that the, the the vorticity field is divergence free. Actually, let me backtrack, that's not an assumption. It's just a property that we're using. Uh, because we have that the rotisia field, it came from the curl of the velocity field. 
right? Then if you take the, the gradient of the history, this is going to be the gradient of the curl, which by definition is zero. So the, the, the rotisserie field needs to be the divergence field. So that's not even an assumption. It's not it's an assumption. Right. You have to realize. Yeah. Yeah. OK, yeah. So uh, um, that's, yes. a, that's a good catch. Like, the only assumption in the vortex particle field is that uh, it is incompressible. Right. Okay. And, and, and actually, it just happens that if you don't assume that it's incompressible, then here you have another term with a gradient of, of the velocity of there. Mm. But it yes. can be solved. It's just like, for our purposes, it's not for this. So I know something in the EPM um, that comes from Winkleman's paper is there's a, a treatment. I, I haven't actually dug, dug into the code or know how it works, but where you somehow treat it to make sure that the, it is divergence free. Right. Uh, so would any any time that it becomes not divergence free, is that just a, a product of numerics? We're, we're going to get there. OK. okay. So we're, we're going to, right now, so, so this is, this has nothing to do with the vortex particle method itself right now. Let, let me just declutter some things. So we have, um, we have the linear momentum. Oh, I think it turned out. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> for, for a second. So, so we have the, the linear momentum equation. And then this one is related to the angular momentum. So it, it came from the from the from the linear momentum in the Stokes equation. This this is basically the same, but but in terms of uh, of angular momentum, mm. right? Um, so this has nothing to do with the vortex particle matter of yet. Mm. This is just uh, this is just Navier Stokes. Okay. Okay. Incompressible uh, Navier Stokes. Um, so now, and here's where the the vortex particle method comes. In. Uh, let's say that you have a flow or uh, that you have a initial conditions of a flow. You, you, have, you have a flow that you know everywhere uh, the, the value of velocity. Uh, because you know the value of velocity, you know the value of, of rotisserie. Mm -hmm. So let's say that initially you know uh, the, the, the rotisserie field everywhere. So what you do is that you discretize the, the vorticity field in, in terms of particles. So particles are equivalent to a mesh on mesh based CFD. Uh, in, in the vortex particle method, instead of having fixed uh, fixed uh, elements, you have you have elements that move in space. Um, yes. So you discretize this uh, vorticity field into uh, a basis function. That it has coefficients, and then here's just whatever basis function you are choosing. So this is uh, so at, at every position of your elements, these particles, uh, you place one basis function that it has a center because that's the position of the particle, uh, and then you calculate that relative to where is so that you're trying to get the physical field. Uh, and then this is a coefficient associated with that basis. Like, yeah. Right. Okay. So, so the, the, this is this is the discretization as well. That you, you have a rotisserie field and then you discretize it into into particles. That what you need what's to the, know. What's the shape of the basis function? Um, so you can do whatever you want. So okay. the, the original, the, the classic, uh, uh, the, the classic uh, vortex particle method. So if this is R, R is just a basis from the center to, to the basis function. The classic uh, vortex particle method uses just the, what is it called? The delta dirac basis. So it is okay. here, zero everywhere, and then it becomes, uh, actually it's just, it's just one. Does delta drag does one or does it? It's, it's a derivative that comes from Yeah, the integral is kind of, because you right. want the total of this key. Right. So the way you're thinking about it is if you're everyone intentional at one point, right. 
Yeah. 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 The velocity that that kernel is going to induce is going to move. Uh, it's going to move like. It's going to look like this. It goes to infinite. And that's a problem for numerics because when you're working with values that go beyond the floating point. So instead of using a, a singular uh, basis function, uh, you need to use something that, that is smooth in space, something that it, it is spreading that would be not, uh, not concentrating at one point, but spreading it around. So um, one convenient uh, basis function is just a, just a Gaussian that is going to look like this. Or it's not exactly like one, it's just a little bit of the integrates one. And then that means that your your uh, velocity field now instead of going to infinite, it actually decays. Um, yeah. So at, at the center, it goes to zero. So, okay. so uh, how tight you make your you make your your Gaussian, that's related to what is the volume in space that each vortex particle will descend. So each vortex particle it has a a, a sigma. A smoothing gradients associated to it. Right. So, so that's why here in the basis function, I put a sigma because it just depends on the sigma of that uh, particle. Right. So, so with this, let's keep this in mind. Uh, now, let's go back to. Uh, First off, uh, let, let, let's talk about vorticity and velocity. So, uh, vorticity is just a curl of velocity. Now, in your governing equations, you you have vorticity, and then in the vortex particle discretization, you are you are discretizing the vorticity. So, everything you're working with is the vorticity field. Now, out of the vorticity field, you need to recover the the velocity. So you need to uncurl this expression. Uh, the way you do that is is, is called the uh, bio savard uh, it's not a it's a straight straight it's, a law. it's a law. It's a law, I think. Bio savard law. Law, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Which which the solution is it looks something like this. I can't remember exactly what it is. It's like four or pi. Uh, then you have whatever was on this side curled with the, 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 the position vector uh, over three times the, the norm of that, and that's integrated over the entire space. So it's, it's, a, it's an ugly expression, but it, it, can, it can be done. But yeah, here, here you just plug whatever kernel you're using and then just develop the map, and then you have. Uh, another way that is easier is assuming that the velocity field came from a vector potential field. So like in, in, in potential flow theory, you are assuming that the, the velocity field came from a, a, a scalar potential. This is key. The full picture. If this was, uh, if this was an irrotational, you needed another another component that it wouldn't be zero when you take a curl of this, and that uh, it is a vector potential. So if if, if you only have the, the the scalar potential when you take a curl over this, the the curl over this is going to zero. But then if, if you have rotational uh, stuff, then this goes to zero, and all that you, that, that is remained there is the scalar potential. So taking the uh, putting these two equations together, this means that uh, replacing this and there, 
then that is the curl of the curl of the vector potential field is is actually netted uh, to the what this would be. So, so the, this is uh, the, this is a definition of a Poisson equation. So here you have a uh, you're taking the the two times the curl over a field and you know the solution of that. And now you're trying to recover okay what was the field that, that it was. So in the process of that, you use a, a Green's function, you do some crazy math, and then you end up with an equation that it solves for this, and from this you get the velocity field. It's a lot of math, but it, it, it's good. It's nothing difficult. So the, 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 the entire thing that I wanted to say is that from knowing the, the velocity field, you can recover the, the velocity field. You know, this is very cool. Okay, uh, so then uh, having this discretization of the rotation field, what you do is that uh, now you're trying to use this discretization into the scenario state situation. Um, one, one assumption that, and this is kind of historical, in how the both experimental method was developed. Uh, one basic assumption was that here, in, instead of this being an actual smoothing function, uh, this was a delta dy. And if, if that, that basis function was a delta dy, then that means that uh, the, the coefficient, the strength of every particle, uh, it was, it was uh, basically just the, the volume integral of the, the velocity the, the velocity field. So so you could have approximated the the the, the strength of every particle by just taking the average um, velocity that, that that particle represents and then multiplying it by the volume. Um, and that that's yeah, that, that works if you're working with the delta of the Now, how, how do we go, how do we put this into there? If we have a delta of the rack, um, well, actually, let's take this equation and multiply it by the volume of every particle. And then we put this in there. Well, actually, let's go back. Do we do this? Uh, yeah, if, if we take uh, this expression that it has a delta Dirac and we put it there, uh, the delta Dirac, it only works at the position of every particle. So this, uh, the, the sum goes away and it just becomes the uh, gamma, the, the strength of every particle, the delta Dirac gets rid of, of everything else. And then uh, everything that is vorticity just becomes uh, a gamma. In the, well, in this term. So it becomes gamma divergence. Uh, mm -hmm. And then this, you can replace it exactly. So here you have to somehow model this term. And here I call it four. This is. All the derivative. This is the component that changes the strength of every particle. In terms of this case, of course. Yes. I think the part that's tricky for me in medial distance more time left on the other end is um, the you're taking the vorticity, um, the average vorticity within the particle multiplying it by a volume and that's the circulation. I think that's the circulation. Yeah. Okay. And this is not the same circulation in the sense of you need to go with the, the line in the middle, the uh, velocity. So the, the, when we talk about the, the total circulation, 
uh, this is the, the definition. Uh, it is uh, the, the, the PC times the volume. Now, when we're talking about the circulation that we usually see in like in two dimensional airflow section, uh, that circulation, the, the one that is a scalar, it is defined as the vorticity uh, over the element or uh, area, which is approximated as uh, the, the, the average uh, vorticity there times the area mm -hmm. that you want to bring in over. So the the scalar uh, vorticity, in the, the scalar situation is, it is associated with two, to the vectorial situation by just multiplying by another dimension to go from the area to the volume. Okay, yeah. So for, for example, in, in the, in the in flow on a steady, when we have uh, the lifting line, right? So this is the wind, then here we have the, the lifting line. Mm -hmm. The way that I, I that I convert it into into particles is that I have the each section of the filament, um, and then I take that um, that circulation of, of that filament, and then I multiply by the length of that the filament, mm -hmm. and that's my my Victoria circulation. Because I, 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 I'm approximating. So the, the only thing that I knew there was, was, was this value, and then I'm approximating it by just multiplying by the other dimension. Mm -hmm. So it is an approximation. Yeah, okay. Yeah, good. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, yes. just a question. So basically all of this is assuming you know the circulation. All so. is assuming that you knew your initial conditions. So you need you need a source of vorticity. So, so you you need to know. Uh, okay, right. Because you can tell you can tell how it changes in time, but you need you need to know what you started with. Okay. So you, you, you need initial conditions and, and boundaries. Yep. So. Uh, so I guess the the crux of it is how do you choose those initial conditions, so that it works. <laughs> Right, so that, that depends on like the um, model that you have. So if you have a lifting line, it's a straightforward. If you have a, a vortex panel method, it's also straightforward. Just to convert anything that is filament that already calculated the situation is straightforward to convert into the strength of the panel. Right. So basically anytime that you already know the, the vorticity, which knowing the circulation is equivalent to knowing the vorticity, then it's straightforward. Uh, yeah. So you, you say it's approximately equal to the average circulation times the volume. Is it actually equal to just the volume integral over the volume of the vorticity? So if we're using, or I guess, is that correct? Exactly. Yeah, okay. So if we're using the basis function, if you really wanted to do it, you would. You would integrate with that basis function over the entire particle volume. Uh, so, so the, the, this approximation is motivated by using the Dirac delta. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but then we, we already we already saw that it, it is a headache to work with the Dirac delta because it's single. Right. So with this uh, with this mentality is that we got with, with this mindset is that we got to this governing equation. But then we went oh, back okay. and then we replaced the delta with a smooth uh, smoothing function on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. It's not the direct delta. But then we kept the same uh, documentation. Mm -hmm. And here is where we broke the assumption that the TC flow was going to be the oh, okay. Because the direct delta makes all of this perfect, mathematically perfect. There are no no errors, but mm. like the the, the the like divergence is preserved relatively well. Um, but then once once you introduce anything else that have the delta, then you can't you, you don't have this equation anymore. But you're still using, it. and that's what introduced a lot of the 
ka insecure sa buhay ko. So, yeah. So the what happens is that um, okay, let's assume actually let's let's just make a, a, a fast exercise on just trying to see what happens if we put this in there. What so we put this expression uh, in. Um, we'll replace it, the vorticity here with this expression that we have here. And we have the total derivative of this expression. So it goes to Then uh, discuss you were just going to get to. Uh, then technically, to 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 arrive to a different equation, you, you will need to develop this. Um, yes. Um, so if, if we were to to to, to move the the twelve derivative inside the the sum, we would have this. Uh, this term times the gamma plus the Victoria circulation as a product here. As a product here. Um, plus, sorry, it's the gamma. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, yes. And here we, we have the, the same term that, that we have. Um, so now if we, if we look back to, to the equation that we had before, the only thing that we had before was uh, the total derivative of the, the, the total circulation was equals to whatever we had, right? So what happened is that uh, this is the actual equation that we should be solving for, but this is what, what we, we actually have. So this is the correct equation, this one. Uh, so in here, what we do is that, first off, we assume that, okay, this is a bit uh, direct delta, or anything that becomes one, when we evaluate it there. I mean, this other term, we're assuming like, yeah, it doesn't change in time. Mm -hmm. And that's where, it, in, in, my, in my theory of why the VP is actually unstable, is because of this term. Mm -hmm. There's something in there that we're not accounting for. So in here, what we are assuming is that, so, so the, the, the basis function in reality, it represents the volume of the particle. Now, when the particle is, is, is traveling in the fluid domain, it's gonna stretch, it's gonna turn around, it's having all these, the, the volume is, is changing, like, all over the place. And since we're not accounting for that, uh, then we're missing like this term is actually very significant in some conditions, especially mm -hmm. when when things start to break down, like the structure of the wave starts to break down. So did you assume that that's a goal? So then your dilation rate is zero throughout, and so your volume is constant. So that the perimeter is not necessarily constant, but the volume is constant. You say uh, observation. This um, isn't the volume of the fluid domain, right? But incompressible is the density, not the volume. Yeah, because yeah, but you're so if you have some fluid element, if it's incompressible, you can change the shape of that however you want as long as the volume stays the same. Right, yes. So the, the, the volume itself is just the same, but the, the volume is the is the form. But yeah, you're right. right. So the volume is the same, the perimeter is the same. Right, exactly. exactly. And these this is volumes of particles, right? This isn't necessarily the entire fluid domain. Uh, yes. So, so, so uh, associated with every particle, there is one basis function. So that, that basis function somehow represents the volume of that one particle. Right. So that is a total derivative, correct? Right. It's the only part of that is temporal. It's a 
manifolds. There's right. three spatial terms that we're totally familiar with. Exactly. Exactly. So and, and those those other uh, terms, the convective convective term, that's where we we, we understand okay how you are deforming. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So like I, I, I'm, this is something that I haven't seen in the literature, but I think that if we were to actually use these equations instead of the actual equations that we solve for in the DTM, things would be way more stable. Hmm. Now the difficulty is that now you can't have a, a basis function that is one-dimensional. Mm -hmm. Now you would have to work in three dimensions. It's like a multivariate Gaussian mm -hmm. that in, in each axis has a different smoothing. So then when the particle is coming in a space, that those axes are changing. And then when the particle is being stretched, each of those is moving uh, where, where, where you are they change in each direction according to the stretching. Right. Um, okay. Well, well that, that's actually a, a, another thought is, is that instead of trying to change the vectoral circulation from just whatever is in this other side, you could always just keep track of the toxicity field and then apply a radial basis function at right? each time step that it preserves that toxicity field. Yeah, that's preserves that toxicity field. Yeah. So instead, instead of um, so instead of arriving to a divine equation that tells you how the, the strength changes, you could just Take this. Don't 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 try to develop an all equation. Just take this. Since you started with the toxicity field, uh, you already knew it, right? So then, in the next time step, for for being able to step forward, you calculate how the toxicity is going to change at every point. Now you still need particles to be able to to do all of your uh, to to record the the. The velocity field. So place particles, whatever you need to place particles to discover size the uh, toxicity field. Calculate the distance. And that, that's going to tell you, okay, when I step in time, this is how the toxicity field is going to change. Um, and then you just change it like that. Now, what happens is that since you change the toxicity field, now you need to place new particles somewhere. You need to where this field size again. And you can you, you could do that with uh, the local suspension. So you, you're in this problem. So first you only did this problem where you started the flow. Um, and now if this is changing in time, then you know, at every time you can just run a local suspension calculation. It's just like a matrix inversion problem. Oh, okay. Uh, to recover okay what I mean my, my strength from then that I'm using for the velocity problem. Anyway, it's, it's so what's the motivation of extracting the circulations in that case? Um, which what is in the in the VPN um, that Flowing Study uses, um, you don't actually have to create new particles. All you do is you calculate the stretching in the right. So it's in, um, and you just convect the particles you can create. Why wouldn't that work um, if you were just to go straight with the vorticity? Uh, because if, um, <clears throat> so okay, uh, we are using the particles to recover the velocity, right? right. And, and we, we got the particles from this criticizing the, the physical that we need, right? Now, if we are changing the vorticity field from here, now we have a new vorticity field. So if we calculate the, the velocity field from the old particles, then that's a different field. Right? It's not, we didn't update correctly. Um, so we would have to discrete size the vorticity field again to be able to get particles and get the, the velocity field again. Anyways, so that, that, are you doing that anyway then? 
uh, I am doing that, but that's the point for a different reason. And that's to be able to capture this possible. Um, yeah, so I am running on an idea, but actually I avoid running out every time, every time. So for example, for any actual water simulation, the, the Reynolds number is so high that sure, there, there is more to see, but I never get to the point that I need to run the idea. Oh, okay. Yes. Right, this is convenient. It's convenient. Yeah. Okay. This would be a great research question thing. Can we completely redo the map for what it right. does and try to do it? Yeah. Now it's more stable. No, that, that's just a thought of okay, how is it that we could avoid uh, the instabilities that we're facing with by just reviewing the map, rebuilding the map? Now let's just backtrack and let's let's say let's let's assume okay, the method that we have is what we have. So now how do we work with it? So this was just just thinking, okay, how do we review the method? Now let's just go back to what the actual method that we have is. Um, yes, so with this discretization we put in there and then our governing equations. Well, we have two governing equations. We have the, the position of every particle in time changes just according to the local velocity field at that point. So each, each, each particle just convex according to the local velocity. And that, that just comes out of continuity. Now, and, and here's where all the problems come, is when, when you convert the, the, the momentum equation into something in terms of the strength. But this is what we have. That the strength of every particle will change in time like this. So we have, so, so this equation is telling us that the total derivative of the, the, the total circulation, like if it's saying like the strength of every particle in time will change like this. It's saying there is gonna come something, uh, yeah, it's, it's gonna come, that, that change will come from this term, we're gonna come back to it and, and talk about it. Uh, and then it's gonna change because of this course of that, that is that term here. And that we, we can model a, 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 a just multiple approaches for modeling that diffusion. Um, but yeah, uh, this this term here uh, is what is called the stretching term. But it means that if you have a volume of, uh, okay, let, let's say that we have a perfectly spherical volume of fluid that is rotating in, in this vector. And by the way, the, the T series just like this is, is just, uh, I think it's half or, or double the, uh, the angular momentum. Two, two times the, the angular velocity. Yes. So if, if we have a, a perfectly spherical volume of fluid that it has the, uh, just a given uh, rotational velocity, and then it is coming through a, a contraction, like we have a streamlined set by contracting. What's going to happen is that as, as this is going through these uh, contracting streamlines, is that uh, this is going to stretch <coughs> in the direction that the streamline is, is stretching. And actually, this can be in the direction of where it's stretching. <coughs> and since since this is being stretched, uh, that uh, makes that rotational velocity to speed up. Mm -hmm. So it is just conservation of angular momentum. Like you are stretching in one axis where things were rotating and you're increasing the, the angular inertia and so it has to speed up. Right. And that, right. That's, that's what this term does. Right. Like mathematically, th th this is what it's telling you that as things are stretching in one direction, the, the the, the, the rotation needs to, to increase. Mm -hmm. Or if, if it is expanding in a certain direction, then it needs to 
increasing that rate to preserve and the other one. So that, that's why I've been starting this call with stretch and change. <laughs> so that's why I learned something like this. Um, that's why things that have this way. really pretty. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> um, you know, the swirling up in between the rotor, this, this up wash, and it goes up into this string tube with the air like that. Mm -hmm. They start to blow up, and this is going to have to go back in. Do you want to do you want to jump in, in the Zoom call and show me this screen? Just sure, to, yeah. to, to have a recording. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So this is a simulation that I ran recently, and um, you can see um, as the rake develops and the, the weight behind the wings starts to get pulled up, and you can tell it from this view, it's going to pull up around that side, and then almost like a like a string tube up between the rotors. Um, as we get this, the fluid getting pulled down, mm -hmm. it's getting pushed up. Um, so anyway, I mean, up in here, where this is where it starts to blow up, where it does blow up. Um, you can see these local particles as they're moving up, and they're the arrows are lengthening and the circulation is really increasing, right. which is yeah, makes sense. Yeah, so the, the, the VPM is, is full of all sorts of instabilities when things just start to stretch out too much. And, and the reason is because, first off, the stretching is not uh, correctly captured because of this approximation that we did when we got here. Mm -hmm. And second off, um, is because basically as things start to stretch out, uh, you increase the, the, the vorticity, things start to go more turbulent. Oh. Um, like, uh, so turbulence, what it is, is just instabilities. Mm. Like in, in the, in, in the Navier-Stokes equation, it comes because the Navier-Stokes equation is a, a chaotic equation. Small mm. changes lead to completely different results. Mm. Um, so, um, turbulence comes out of just the small fluctuations that it start to, to increase and then that, that, that breaks the structure and then that, that, that means that the microstructure that you've had in the flow field start to, 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 to dive down into smaller and smaller structures, down to the molecular mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. um, yes, so, so every time that you're stretching something, you're producing more vorticity and that makes things more uh, prone to bring to turbulence break down. Okay. Um, and here, here in the VPN, we don't, we don't have, there, there are multiple things going on. Um, um, so vorticity uh, and turbulence is just captured up to the resolution of the mesh that you're doing. There isn't anything to smooth out or to resolve, to model the, the unresolved domain of turbulence, uh, which means that uh, the numerics that you're doing when you are uh, when you are trying to capture something that is turbulent is not right. There is so much so much else that, that you are missing. Mm -hmm. um, it just happens that the VPN just 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 make those numerics that that, that, that is doing uh, they are just unstable. But they're gonna start increasing, feeding each other, and just and mm -hmm. on a mesh based CFD. You don't have that because the mesh itself. It produces numerical dissipation. It is a smoothing things out. 
So small fluctuations that are intrinsic to troponins on a mesh base uh, CFD are smoothed out. But mm -hmm. the numerics are just, just getting away with it, which is unphysical. But it's very mm -hmm. convenient for numerical mm -hmm. Okay. So, so, uh, so, so this brings us to how so that we can make things more stable. Um, what happens is that uh, a mesh based CFD, this, uh, this constitution, it is artificially increased by just the resolution of the mesh. And that's what it makes things more stable on a mesh, uh, mesh based CFD. So you could either, to make things more stable, you could either artificially increase, increase your uh, viscous diffusion, mm -hmm. just multiply by 10, and then all of a sudden you will see that your simulation is way more stable, mm -hmm. way more stable. So maybe you, you could even have like a, is the circulation reaches a certain level, like start to ramp up your viscosity and probably tell me. Yeah. It could be a thing. Or, or just, 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 just it, started, it started from the beginning being very viscous. Hmm. Yeah, let's see what it does. It will smooth out the chaos of the solution for sure. Now, the question so, so everything comes down to you okay, what is it that you're trying to actually resolve a model? You're not trying to do any turbulence modeling of saying, okay, what is the, the protein at the molecular level? You don't care about that. All that you care is to get a loading distribution along the way. And um, for getting that, you don't need to know the dynamics of the small eddy dynamics in the way. All that you need to know is what, what is the velocity field at the point of location. So uh, and, and that's something that, that I, I don't do my simulations myself, just because it feels like, yeah, it's not really uh, physically correct to artificially increase my discussion if I can. Um, because I, I have found all other ways of making my simulations myself. But, but that was definitely one thing that, that you can do. And I, I have done it before. When, when I first started including the discourse system in my, in my simulation, I, I started, I, I tried some simulations that, that, that were uh, very low when I and then I realized like this is so stable, like <laughs> this is so easy. And then I went to act to the actual world of Reynolds Thunder and then yeah, yeah. It, was, it wasn't. Right. Okay. okay. Yeah. Interesting. Um, Have you heard of lattice Goldstein methods? Yeah. 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 Um, that was something that was mentioned in some discussions that are um, um, anyway. Um, some people were wondering could you Somehow, in the different methods, when you get to the signal again, uh, potentially the last yeah. question or something. Um, but, I, I would say, like, why in the world would you be trying to resolve the turbulence? The turbulence of the flow. Like, because for, for sure, yeah, like when, when you're reaching the, the, the limits of the resolution of your VPN simulation, you could shift it into a mesh based CFD or like a light small one. But is that what you are actually trying to do to resolve all the turbulence in, in the flow? Yeah, really, what you're interested in is what kind of interactions you get at the aircraft, like at the solid surfaces. Right. So if it's in the far field, maybe you don't care about it. Yeah. If it's in the near field, um, I guess, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. What do you do about the near field instabilities? Uh, I usually don't have any instabilities in the near field. Just like the, just like what I did when I shared my screen. Oh. Uh, um, now what happened there, uh, in there, is is relatively turbulent at time. But as the so so what happened in the simulation that you were showing, mm -hmm. uh, the wake is starting to develop, right? And the the head of the wake starts to. Uh, below this plane, right? And, right. And, and this is just a big fat rocket stream. Right. And that's when it starts to pull everything down. So you need that plane to, to be able to start developing the flow, right? Now, once, uh, and that's physically incorrect, but that, that, that's what happens when the rotor starts to spin. The rotor starts to spin. Now, when, once, once everything has already fully developed, that, that plane is, it breaks down into turbulence of the uh, 
So ideally, we want to develop everything with the plume nicely and then until everything develops and, and it's, it's nice. Now, this plume is, is always uh, tensible down. So in, in, in the case of your simulation, that plume is, is breaking down because it's going through the room. So it will break down. And because it's breaking down, it's going to turbulent regime and then just everything goes. It's mm -hmm. bad. It's, yeah. it's, it's can you point uh, out like just so it has a good feel for how you uh, do, do you want to show it? Yeah, I'll show again. Um, again. Yeah, so where yeah, if you want to mouse, mm -hmm. you can point out. So here. Um well, at this point, it has really good. So here is it open. It's trying to to roll back, and then as it is going through the room, then things are breaking down. So this this plume that you see, like uh, that reverse flow that is there, that's mm -hmm. the the edge of the plume. It is it is pulling things this way. Right. So right. that 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 that's uh, that reverse flow that, that you're seeing right there. Um, right. And that that that's what uh, starts to break down. Like here. Like over here, we see like, yeah, it's really good. It's, it's not out. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's just. And that's not, is that unfeasible for a hovering quadrator? Would you, um, so you wouldn't have any fluid falling back up yeah. in that area between? Okay. No, 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 Chop off that starting uh, So what I will I will recommend uh, just 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 look at the simulation. Um, so something that you can do is that okay the, the problem here is that the plume that's uh, that breaks very easily and it is it is inherently turbulent just because things are rolling and it's, it's breaking all that structure. Um, and as it is going through the wing, it is just it just becomes more turbulent and everything breaks down. Right? Mm. Uh, what I would recommend, uh, and this is something I haven't tried myself, run one rotor simulation in isolation. With all four rotors or just with a single rotor? Just, just one. Okay, I've done that. Just, just uh, run one rotor simulation, have the weight fully developed until the plume is like way, way in the top field. Then you can chop it and do whatever you want with it. Mm. Then you could take this simulation of this one rotor and then stitch it into four rotors and put mm. the one and then run the simulation from there. So uh, okay. what you're doing there is that you are, you are one starting your simulation. Mm. So with that, the plume is not at the wing anymore, so like things are gonna be way easier. Oh, to, that's to Another thing that you can do yeah. is that you could run the same simulation but with a free stream. So when the simulation starts, you have a free stream that it helps to pull that plume down. Mm. Um, yeah, the, the plume is gonna try to to, to break down and. It's, it's going to be very unstable, it's going to be like close to, to go to go up. Uh, but then the, the free stream is, is helping uh, to move that, that plume down. And once it's, it's already like in the far field, then chop it. Well, or you could like gradually decrease the free stream, then chop it. And now uh, now you're in the mm -hmm. regime that you're actually interested in modeling. Yeah. So okay. that, that, that's also okay. one starting your simulation. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's good ideas. Um, what else? Um, if you were to, yeah, if if you were to to increase your uh, viscosity a lot, hmm. that would also help. And maybe start out with it very viscous, and then decrease it later. Decrease it later. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, so, something to understand is that the, 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 the instability comes out of this stretching term. That is just stretching things as, as, as the, the flow is just uh, changing and like the particles are coming further away. Uh, 
Yeah, that is stretching is only acting on the on the Laplace equation. We should also be stretching the, the smoothing radius to preserve all the lab and do all this. My, my theory is that if we were to do that, things would be inherently stable. Mm -hmm. um, so right now, is it not changing the smoothing radius? So it is the, the the smoothing radius is always expanding because of this cost. Oh, okay, but that's that's the only thing right now in the numerics that changes the smoothing radius. Right. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, so yeah, so I, I, it is that is stretching that is uh, that is just just giving way too much. Uh, and it's because we're, we're not solving what what happens when uh, when the. the the, the real basis also being stretched like that. I, my, my theory is that that will subtract from um, the stretching of mm -hmm. Um Now, since this guy is a problem, what you can do is that you can just get rid of that one in the development equations and solve it, and then everything will be way more stable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At, at that point, you're not even solving a real stretch anymore. Mm -hmm. But it's something that is very similar. It's like a solution that is it is. At that point, it's just a it is a bulk experiment like like uh, unsteady VLN kind of simulation. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. not capturing that many slopes; it's not capturing uh, it's continuity. Mm -hmm. But it, it gives a solution that is it's not that simple. Okay. Um, now, when when you are increasing the the viscosity, effectively what you're doing is that you are taking away from the stretching term. You are you're putting right next to it something that is this more powerful from it that is uh, taking away energy from mm. from the switching. Right. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That we work on all of those and see how they do. Yeah. What else? Yeah. Questions? Um, I don't know. I just I remember doing a breakdown. So if I, I don't think really cool, like, it's going to break some of the parts of the end, so, yeah. but that's like, it can't, it's a, 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 So the, the problem is, it's true. Uh, yeah, once once you increase the the, the viscosity, you know, you know. now uh, when we are doing all this uh, weight treatment of cutting things off, effectively what we're doing is that we are just removing all the things from the uh, So this. So basically, it's a brand's face. Is it what? Right. 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 Yeah. Mm, it's nothing. I think it's better. I'm sure everyone has more questions. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's where we're walking up. <laughs> hey, um, I have two questions. One's just kind of a summary. Can you just like summarize what causes all the what causes all the instabilities? Like, um, yeah. So so first off, uh, what causes the instabilities is not something that is like well known that, that we know. Okay, this is the reason. Um, so the, the actual answer is like we don't know. Um, now, I, 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 this is something interesting. That, uh, last week I was emailing a guy that uh, he he has been working on VPN for like ten years. We were we were just bouncing back, back and forth ideas on okay what is going on like how do we make this this thing more stable and something that he mentioned is that okay things on mesh based VPN are stable because of the representation in terms of the mesh. And then he said that he had been in conversation with people that are doing ultra high fidelity fine development DLP. And, and because they are getting to a point that everything like they are getting so much they're getting rid of so much of the uh, medical dissipation that now the networks are becoming a yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, anyways, um, now, 
so the, 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 the actual the, the actual answer is like yeah we don't know now uh my my, my intuition is that it comes out of uh the approximation of going from from here from Navier's nodes to the governing equation of the vpn it's not even correct once you introduce a kernel that is not the uh direct delta um yeah, and that, that, that means that the, the stretching that comes on, on, uh, out of the grand equation is, is, is just too strong. You're missing one. Uh, so now, how do you, and, uh, uh, and this is my, my, my own rationale, is that, okay, stretching is, is, is not correct. Um, and also, when, when, when things are over the stretching, uh, that leads to trouble and breakdown. In, in our method, we are not doing any any sort of random search. So what we are not resolving with our discretization is just unresolved. We're not introducing that into, into the computation. Uh, I think that that's also another place of instability that uh, the unresolved domain, instead of dumping out and disappearing, uh, your un unresolved numerics, uh, they are just inherently unstable. And that brings some other resources. So like always try to avoid two bits because you're not resolving that. You could resolve it if, if you were to disgrace I think it's fine now. But yes, if, if you're not doing that, then just avoid anything that, that involves two bits because that will be unstable. Um, yeah, and the solutions are uh, remove out of your computational domain any areas that would be breaking down into two bits. Um and then I just stop the stretching, like one, one, one thing to do is uh, warm starting, warm your simulations, uh, artificially increasing your specification by just multiplying all the stops. It's not, it's not physically correct, but if you're desperate for a, for a stable simulation, then it's not real. Uh, now, now the, the good news is that once you um, once you, you have a simulation that is fully that is very stable, and you are good to run any sort of simulation. Like right. in, in my rotor simulations, then once I have uh, my, my simulations uh, stable, then I can just move the rotors around. I can change change the RPM, change the everything, like the geometry. So setting up the first simulation was the most uh, difficult thing. Uh, because we have to, to 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 find out okay how do I make the simulation stable and once it is stable then we are good to run any sort of hmm. okay. so once you get it stable I can feel doing something by increasing the capacity so I can make it stable and then it kind of fails and then like one like one but then it decreases the capacity exactly so that, that, that would be one time in the Yeah. Um, question. How do you choose when to drop your, drop the points, the particles? Uh, ideally, you wouldn't. Uh, now, yeah, because like, in reality, like, the fluid doesn't disappear, right? But right. Since you're, you're trying to, to bring things to, to stability. Uh, how do I choose? Um, there, there, there are different approaches. There's most approaches that you could imagine. Um, my, my, my criterion is that, okay, I want to do something that is as physically correct as possible. So one thing that is completely unphysical is that you could go through your, all of your particles and see, okay, which one seems to have a strength that is uh, way too large. And it seems like that, that, that guy is going out and then just merely remove it from the in the field, uh, you could do that, but that's that's basically banana. Like, right? Yeah. Um, what what I do is that I define a, a threshold. So in, in, in the rotor simulation, so have the, the rotor rotating over here, and then things are gonna start developing, and then over here it's gonna break down into two uh, For my rotor simulation, so all I want is to be able to to capture okay what is going on here in the new field. So uh, things that I'm not interested in capturing, I will just uh, everything that passes through this threshold. 
between a mesh, a okay. mesh base CFD that's equivalent to having a computational domain that you have to dominate. Okay. So it's not, it's, not, it's not anything that is like completely unphysical and, and like crazy. Yeah. It's just like, yeah, it's just, that's your computational domain. Okay, so once it passes the threshold, it's done. Right. It's, okay. Okay. Um, I mean, could you also do, I mean, I'm just spitballing here, but you could also say that maybe if the contribution to what you're interested in is low enough, you could just drop the particle, right? So Would that be example, another way of doing it? For example, the, the, the one example that, that, that I was saying that you could go through all of your particles and see the one that it, it seems to be too large in strength and remove that one. Uh, if you do that, you you will probably get exactly the same solution than if you had a very stable simulation. So like it wouldn't change your solution at all. It's just like to to myself it feels like yeah that's not basically correct. So I I just try to stay away from it. But oh, yeah. yeah. I mean I was talking about the opposite. If it's small enough that it's negligible. Right. Right. Um. Okay. A uh, couple couple other questions. Uh, I'll start with this one. Um, is there like a steady extension of this or is it purely unsteady? I mean, I'd imagine that the instabilities cause some issues when you're trying to do a steady solution. So the the steady equivalent to all of these would be the would be a long solution. So let's say that you have a wing Uh, in reality, the, the wig, if, if it is uh, fully and steady, the, the wig curls, well, uh, uh, the, the wig um, it is, it is rolling up. The, 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 the wig rolls, rolls up uh, behind the, the wing. Right. And that, that would be uh, a unsteady solution. Now, the, the, the steady solution would be just to, to make it quasi steady, but the wig is just rigid. Just feel right. that, that they are just rigid. Um, yeah. But wouldn't uh, the, but you're you're not modeling the viscosity there if you don't have ELM, right? Right. Yeah. And, but I guess that probably wouldn't have a big impact on the wake, steady wake, or yeah. I don't know. So, 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 for example, if you are trying to model just a wing, I would say just go with any steady or quasi steady solver, and you would get good enough of a solution that using a full blown CFD or VPN solver. The, right. the solution you will get will be exactly the same. Um, so, so yeah. Now the, the VPN is, is is thought for doing rational aerodynamics. Things are like rotors blowing on each other and blowing on the wing and doing all sorts of interactions, but that would be captured on a steady quasi steady state. Okay. Um, but like, so how does this compare then to like unsteady VLM? Yes. I mean, you could. For unsteady VLM, you can kind of have get, have a steady solution, right? Where you have some wake roll up. Right. So VLM, a, a steady VLM, all it does is that it says, okay, we're gonna break down all these filaments into sections. Um, in time, each one of these filaments, the center of the filament, will move according to local uh, velocity. So that 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 in time means that yeah, it, it will roll up. Uh, so, so in, in, in practice, that's solving for the continuity equation because things are convecting according to a local velocity field, mm -hmm. but it's not doing anything with momentum. It's not preserving any momentum. So, so a, a, a an unsteady VLM is not solving Aguirre Stokes at all. Right. Instead, instead the, 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 the VPM, the vortex particle method, it is taking Navier Stokes and solving Navier Stokes uh, uh, straight up and solving all of the viscosity, all of the stretching, all of the, all of the uh, momentum dynamics that Navier Stokes predicts. Okay. 
Uh, and then last, I, I was just wondering if you could like summarize, what would you use like, uh, like where do you think VPN fits in in comparison to like CFD, like what use cases would you choose CFD versus via VPM versus like a panel method? Right. Um, so the um, so the VPM is very good for resolving flows that first off are unbounded that they, you don't have any boundaries and the reason for for uh, for being good at resolving things are that doesn't have any boundaries. Is because when you went from the linear momentum to the angular momentum navier Stokes, you took the code over this equation. So you're taking the derivative of that equation. When you take the derivative, you get rid of all your boundary conditions. So right. in the in the in the governing equations of the VPM uh, as they are, you don't have any information about boundaries. So the VPM is is very good at resolving good domains that are unbounded, meaning, for example, a wave, like something that is just going to keep, is vorticity that is going to keep uh, convecting, stretching, and diffusing uh, in the full domain. Uh, so that, that, that's where, where, where the VPM uh, shines the most. We could still introduce the boundaries, uh, but it is, it's kind of difficult. Uh, yes, so that means that any time that you're trying to resolve a boundary layer, uh, that's where I would say like, yeah, don't, don't even try to do a VPN approach. Just go straight up uh, with a uh, with a mesh-based uh, CFD, like a RANS or a LES. Um, yes. So, yeah. what, when you say that, do you mean like, that does, like, you could still get like drag, right? And lift from a VPN. Could you, uh, or so is it more for seeing what's happening in the wake? It is more for seeing what was happening in the wake. Okay. So for interactional aerodynamics, like a rotor blowing on the wing or a, a wing uh, doing some maneuvers uh, uh, in front of another wing, I would say like, yeah, definitely a VPM, that's, that's pretty good. Like use a VPM. But then anything that, that you're trying to resolve with under layers. So for example, for, for calculating drag, drag comes out of uh, the friction that happens in the boundary layer. So right. if you're trying to get to, get to drag, uh, then I would say like, yeah, just, just do a, a mesh-based CFD. So mesh-based mesh CFD, uh, it is very good uh, for resolving boundary layers, but it is really bad for resolving weights because of all of the numerical diffusion that you have in your mesh. So that, that's why for, for being able to resolve weights on, on, a, on a mesh based CFD, it is, you need so much numerical uh, power to resolve things uh, properly. Because a mesh is not, it's not made for that. Uh, it, 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 it is very good for a boundary layer, but not for weights. Instead, the VPN is exactly the opposite. It is like for, for very little computational power, you are resolving your weights uh, uh, very well. So it, 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 it is it is about two orders of magnitude faster than the mesh based CFD for just resolving the, the weight. But the, the drawback is that it is a headache to try to capture the boundary layers, the, the boundary layer on a, on a VPN approach. And so I, it makes you wonder if you should just do like a hybrid kind of overset method. Yeah, a hybrid method where you just have the boundary layer CFD and the right. And, and, BPM and, and people, people outside have, of that. It, it works really well to, to just to have a very a small mesh around the body to resolve uh, the, the boundary layer and get all the, the properties. And then once uh, at, the, at the boundaries of your mesh, then you, you start convecting the, the vorticity in the form of particles. And it works really well. Yeah. yeah, I imagine that would shrink down the CFD problem a decent amount. Um, I mean, usually there's a lot of cells right up near the, in the boundary layer, but there's yeah. still a lot of cells outside the boundary layer that, but I, I guess then if there's like turbulent breakdown, that might also be an issue. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, can, because this, because of the numerical instabilities, you can't really capture like, can you capture a full turbulent breakdown? 
Yeah. Or is it just kind of? Uh, let me let, let me pull up a simulation. Really quick. Um, and like, how good is like the turbulent breakdown that you get from the VPM? Um, let me see. Would you recommend the turbulence class for running the uh, definitely the, the turbulence class is very good for the only <laughs> No, not, not for, for real, okay. like uh, yeah, for, for yeah. learning of, of all this. Okay, yeah. so in this context. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, let's see. Sorry, that's exactly what I asked. The turbulence class. <laughs> no, no. Uh, I, I actually, I, I was thinking like, yeah, like that, that class was, was useful for learning about turbulence. Okay. Um, well, here, here we have a, a simulation. But it, it is it is very good. Along, along the way, it is only using uh, seven. Uh, and then, yeah, like even the, the time stepping is very coarse. And then you see with with this very coarse simulation, uh, it, it is able to resolve everything from like. Uh, this is the near field, this is the far field. Then here, things start to leapfrog, which is physically what happens. And then this leapfrogging uh, leads to breakdown of the vertical structure, and then over here is already fully turbulent. So yeah, um, for very little computational power, you can, you can resolve uh, things up to turbulent breakdown very well. So how much further would you need to extend this animation to see it after it breaks the uh, I would say like half a diameter, like a tiny little bit, and then it will oh. be like, yes. <laughs> okay, gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> yes, yes. So, so what happens is that any, any, anything that is not here in the computational domain, I, I chop it off because then it, that's when the simulation goes up. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so th this is like the, 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 the maximum, like the, the largest, uh, way to have it out. Yeah, you know, you see. Mm. Okay. Okay. Does that answer your question, Taylor? Sorry, uh, say that again. Uh, yeah, it does. It does answer my question. Yeah. That's my question, Eduardo. Yes. So, what is it in the map that captures the uh, like the turbulent breakdown, I, in my understanding, if the input conditions are ideal or perfect, then it would just like the wake would just keep going and never break down. What is it that captures that moment when it suddenly becomes unstable? I don't know if that makes any sense. Um, so let, let me see if I understand the question. So your question is, um, if there isn't any original, like if, if at the beginning there wasn't any turbulence, then how, how is it that, that, that turbulence is being generated and yeah. breaking down, right? Yes, yeah, that's my question. Right, so uh, turbulence is caused by two things. Either uh, a shear layer, well, actually, Yeah, uh, so turbulence could be caused by either a boundary, boundary layer 
Okay. That uh, that the boundary layer is, is generating vorticity, and that's what makes the boundary layer to, to, to go to the land and, and, and train momentum inside the boundary layer and all this. Uh, well, actually, what is turbulence? That, that's the actual question. What is turbulence? Um, I suppose I'd say that turbulence is chaotic flow. Right. Yes. So, yes. Hey, Mark. Do you, do you remember that video that Dr. Ming showed in the aerodynamics class that one time? With, where Which it, one? He had a, a die or there's a, a flow, a fluid flow, and then there is a little tube with a die. Yes. And it started out, it was really smooth, but then eventually you saw it start to get turbulent. Yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, I've kind of been pondering that for yeah. a long time, trying to like yeah, yeah. conceptualize what yeah. is this. So, so, so they, they, they are, uh, Turbulence is a very abstract concept. In, in my concept, turbulence is anything that is not reversible. Okay. Uh, yeah, so under, under that lens, like, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's difficult to talk about, about turbulence. Now, uh, if I understand your question is, how come this, this wake that we're showing here, it, it becomes turbulent and breaks down? Yeah, and if initially it, there's no yeah. turbulence, Right. How does the computer know to become turbulent? Right. So uh, the answer is is because rotor weights are topologically unstable. This, okay. This helicoid that you have, if you draw, if you do the math on this geometry of this helicoid, you will see that any small perturbation would uh, start creating uh, just oscillations that get amplified up to the point that it breaks down the geometry. So okay. It has, nothing, it has nothing to do with viscosity. Uh, it is just uh, in this case the turbulence. I think that is introduced by flowing point position. That is just a very small fluctuation that that affects the geometry, the topology of the wake a little bit, and that gets amplified into all the root problem and all this, which is exactly what also happens in in, in real life. Let me see if I can. Okay. Um, let me pull up a paper that that actually got published this morning. Okay, I think Jeff's about to ask this about what you want to show. Yes. Is, um, is this the one where you show an actual marine propeller wave exactly. next to your simulation? Yes. And, okay. So this is a yeah. marine propeller uh, wave. Actually, let me pull it up. Yes, so the, the pictures in the top, this is a marine propeller that you can actually see the wave because of habitation. So you have uh -huh. habitation bubble, bu bubbles uh, at the tip that just, it falls the, the, the vortex tip. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, so, so what happens is that in, in, in this helicoid geometry, uh, just a small fluctuations in the fluid get amplified and then it, it, it breaks down. Yes. So is it honestly just luck that the numerical um, instabilities are like the floating point position just happens to line up perfectly? No, or? actually, I don't. That, that's a very <laughs> good question. Is it luck? Um, I don't. I don't think it's luck. Uh, so, so the, the 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 argument of saying like, yeah, the turbulence came out of uh, floating point position. That's not accurate. The actual breakdown comes out of the stretching turn. The, the topology is stretching the vortex and that makes uh, the vortex uh, unstable and it starts to also break like that. Mm. Uh, yeah. Which it also makes me wonder, okay, uh, and how much how much was the contribution of floating point position also, I don't know. Right, okay, yeah. yeah. And so that's exactly, 
This is yeah. the video. Maybe I'll share it. On the... Yeah, you want to share your screen? So they just show like fluid flow in a pipe, and then they increase the flow rate, and you see it. It's yeah, okay. You see it further down. Right. It just starts to oscillate. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, I don't have much of an indication for how that happens. This uh, bunch of rain. So the, the, what, what oh, happens is, uh, this is spatial. Yes. Yeah. So what bundle layers generate in vorticity? Yes. And vorticity, uh, well, vorticity is this equation. So it starts to stretch things. Uh, and so it, uh, after a while, vorticity starts to to grow in this cast ball. Like the, the, the areas that you have in the bundle layer, they, they start to break down to smaller and smaller and smaller. Mm. But, uh, yeah. Just everything that is going on the stretching. Mm. It makes me wonder if prevalence is originated just because of the stretching. I, don't know. I remember yeah. that Dr. Ning said for flow like this, like you're showing, Ryan, that if everything was like perfectly ideal, that it would never break down, that it would just stay laminar flow forever, but that there's like some, like there's always some imperfection. Mm. And I'm curious how the VPM is able to line up with that. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. And then the video he showed actually was slightly different from this one. He showed one where instead of just looking spatially down the tube where you can where the boundary layer will develop in the pipe, um, it was just increasing the flow rate and just this this part right here, um, right next to where the fluid, the dye was coming out, that started mm -hmm. the turbulence at higher Reynolds numbers. I remember something like that, yeah. And yeah, so I guess we're saying that in both cases there's some small. I and if you look further down as the weight develops, like these aren't going to be completely even in the pipe. So maybe there's a little bump somewhere and that propagates. But anyway, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. That's right. Now that you say that, I think I remember who's saying that as well. Okay, we have been going for already an hour, an hour and a forty. So, um, any other urgent and pressing questions? If not, we are calling it here. Thanks, Eduardo. That was great. That was really helpful. Thank Thanks, Eduardo. Thank you. Okay. See you guys. See ya.